Okay, I want to mention one other thing about social context, which is this, which is this contagion issue. So it turns out that in the, uh, in the worst, most violent neighborhoods in Chicago, there is really awful gang violence where often, uh, you know, three, four people a day are getting killed. And what happens is somebody gets killed and then the next person is defending that person's honor and so on and the cousin and this and that. And people are killing each other in these neighborhoods all the time. It's so violent. So there's a, a, a friend and colleague of mine named Dr. Gary Slutkin who's an epidemiologist. And he looked at the situation. He lives in Chicago. He looked at the situation and he thought, you know, look, I study epidemics. And epidemics are where you have these viral patterns going around. And he said, why can't we look at violence that way? What if violence is like an epidemic that spreads? You remember in, in Syndrome E, one of the issues was group contagion, right? So he said, look, there are all these social programs to try to combat poverty and housing issues and education issues, all in the hope of stemming violence. But what if we just try to stem the violence itself? What if we address that directly? So he started an organization called Ceasefire, whose motto is Stop Killing People. And the idea with Ceasefire is to understand how violence spreads in a community and how to stop it. How you can interrupt the violence so that just like any disease epidemic that you want to get down below a tipping point, how you get this down below a tipping point. And one of the things, so, so, um, so Gary set this up. It's been a tremendously successful community intervention program for violence intervention. And one of the things I'm doing now is I'm working with Gary to study, to do neuroimaging on the high-risk youth in these neighborhoods and try to figure out what's going on. And the reason it's so important is because of these social context issues. So it turns out that everybody knows that in these neighborhoods, a young man will commit an act of violence in front of his peers. But he won't do it in front of his grandmother. If his grandmother's watching, he won't do it. Now, that's very interesting, right? Because it's the same hardware, but he's running a different software program depending on who's watching him in that instant. So it's a very... It's a very fast switch in terms of social context. And the reason we need to understand this is so that we know how to build and optimize community intervention programs. And so really the heart of what Gary is doing here is setting it up so that there are community expectations. So that if you, you might be mad that somebody's insulted you, but if you respond with violence, you will be ostracized by community elders. And it's a very clever move. It's a way of studying what's going on and using that to try to steer things right. Which leads me to the final point, which is what can we do as we understand these things? How can we make things better when we understand it? So the first thing that I want to point out that I think is so critical is the issue of education. So what really comes out of the Milgram experiments and the Zimbardo experiments and stuff like that is an opportunity for us to teach the next generation about these so it becomes part of their background fabric. They know about these experiments and they know what to do about it. And one of the things that Milgram wrote about in his book, he said, look, I'm going to take, I'm going to take what we learn and distill it down to all the rules that you need to have in place if you want people to listen to you if you're in a position of authority. So, for example, he realized with his different experiments and so on, first of all, you need to prearrange some form of contractual obligation. In this case, it was, we're going to pay you four bucks and then you're going, to be, hey, you're going to participate in this experiment. You give participants meaningful roles, like, OK, you're a teacher, you're a guard, and so on. And those activate particular response scripts. People feel like, oh, I know exactly what to do with that. Um, you present basic rules to be followed. OK, when he gets the answer wrong, you move up to the next level of shock, stuff like that. And then arbitrarily, those can be changed later. Um, you change the semantics of the act if you want people to listen to you. Instead of calling it hurting victims, you use, call it helping the experimenter. Uh, you allow for diffusion responsibility. So you remember I mentioned in this experiment, he says, don't worry, I'm responsible. I'll be responsible for anything that happens to him. Just keep going. Just keep pressing the shock lever. Um, start the path with small steps. OK, just give him a little mild electric shock. And then as it goes on, you just a little more, just a little more, and so on. And it's like the frog in the frying pan. People are good at following those. Um, make exit cost high. You don't let the person leave the experiment, but you do allow them to express Distress. You do allow them to complain because that makes people feel better. If they get to, they'll still go up to 450 volts, but they'll feel better about themselves if they said, oh, I really feel uncomfortable. I don't want to do this. They still do it, but that's one way to keep them in there. Okay, so the point is, Milgram's able to list across you know, places and times all these things that you have in common 
when you get people to have blind obedience to authority, this is what we need to teach our children so that they know the signs to look for, so that they know not to fall for these sorts of things. Okay, that's number one. Um, oh, and offer a large goal, sorry, which is, this is ideologies. So in the case, you know, in the case of the Milgram experiment, it was as simple as we're trying to study the science of memory and how that relates to pain and whether that makes people's memory better. But in the case of, of many of these social awful things that happen, it's we're giving you a safer country. We're cleaning our country of ethnic group X, Y, Z, that sort of thing. Okay, that's number one. Number two is social modeling. So, you know, we've been talking as though everybody catches syndrome E, but in fact, there are always heroes who stand up against authority. This is uh, a group known as the White Rose. It was a student group in Nazi Germany that put all of their efforts into making and disseminating flyers and pamphlets against the actions of the Third Reich. Tragically, they were uh, captured and rounded up and they were all executed by the Nazis. But this is the kind of thing for us to teach our children about celebrating these heroes who stand up against authority so that there's a social modeling that's possible there. So the next time somebody's in that situation, they've at least got a template that they can think about following. Um, the third thing I think we can do about it is thinking cleverly about social structuring. So this is a, a picture of the Iroquois uh, Native Americans who live up essentially where upstate New York is. And they, um, they're known as the League of Peace and Power, but they weren't always known as that. 400 years ago, this was six different tribes who were always fighting with one another. And, and what happened in the 1600s is they were they were combined by a guy who's known as the great peacemaker. He combined them so they're all one nation, but that's not enough. It turns out that if you push people together, you know, you have these alliances, but those can fall apart easily. The very clever part of the way this is structured is in each tribe, people belong to one of 12 clans. Actually, sorry, one of nine clans. So I might be a member of the Seneca tribe and I'm a hawk and you're a member of the Seneca tribe and you're a turtle or you're a wolf or so on. And the thing is, the clans cross-cut against the tribes. And so the idea is, how are the Seneca going to fight against the Mohawk when I'm a bear and you're a bear, and he's a hawk and she's a hawk over there? So the thing is, by cleverly structuring it, you prevent things from happening. And so it's probably naive for us to think about obtaining world peace by getting everyone to get along, because we're very hardwired for in-group, out-group. But you can structure things carefully. So things are counterbalanced so that people can't go fighting against one another. And this is a very clever example of that, I think. And then the last thing is research. Um, you know, I mentioned Zimbardo's idea was to understand the system instead of trying to cure the individuals in it and say, oh, here are some bad apples. We're going to figure out how to cure them because it just keeps happening over and over. It's not about the bad apples. It's about the system. And then I mentioned the, the experiments I'm doing in Chicago right now. We're trying three different kinds of interventions using neuroimaging to figure out what is it that causes people who are going to be aggressive in a situation to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to slow down, I'm going to cool off, I'm not going to do that. And that allows the violence to not spread like a contagion, but instead stops it early, just the way you would address an epidemic. Okay, so the main thing is, in some sense, what I've been telling you about with social neuroscience has to do with how we come to care about others. These systems in the brain that are evolved in emotion that allow us to care about anyone else. And this is what we have evolved to be. We've evolved for eusociality. We're not independent competitors. We're meant to be a group. And the reason I think this is so absolutely critical to study is because this is what's going to define our future. I mean, we pour millions, hundreds of millions, into studies of things like autism and Alzheimer's and so on, and that's terrific. But this kind of thing that I'm talking about tonight, this affects our species in a much deeper way, and there's very little research about this. And so my mission is to understand this more deeply because this is going to be the future of whether we make it or not. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions.